rather be here than have riches untold. I'd rather have Jesus than houses or lands. I'd rather be led by his nail-pierced hand than to be the of oh, the last domain or be held in sin's dread swing. I'd rather have Jesus than anything this world affords today. I'd rather have that men's applause I'd rather be faithful to his dear cause I'd rather have Jesus than worldwide fame I'd rather be true to his holy name of rarest blue He's sweeter than honey from out the cold He's all that my hungering spirit needs I'd rather have Jesus and let him lead than to be the king of a vast domain, or be held in sin's dread way. I'd rather have Jesus than anything this world affords to. This world has a lot to offer, but it don't have nothing to offer me that Jesus can't top. Amen? I hope you agree with that statement. Amen? Otherwise, you're going to waste your life chasing things that don't matter. There's a lot of people doing that these days. They're chasing after things that are going to come up empty in the end. Amen? But I'm tell you right now, I don't care how, how hard life may be with Jesus. Life without Jesus, it's a nightmare. And it ends in the most hor horrific nightmare. All right, take your Bible this morning. Turn with me to Galatians 5, verse 19 through 26. We're going to get into some meaty stuff this morning. Amen. We're going, we're going to look, at, we're going to look at, uh, at the works of the flesh and the works of the Spirit. We're going to look at the fruit of the Spirit this morning. Amen. We're going to learn why we need to walk in the Spirit. Why we need to walk in the Spirit. Amen? The Bible tells us if we walk in the Spirit, we'll not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Amen? And that's the verse that we saw, we ended on, I do believe, last week, if I'm not mistaken. Yes. Uh, this I say, verse 16, it was one of the verses, walk in the Spirit and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Now let's look at verses 19 through 26. Let's read them and then we'll go to the Lord in prayer. Paul said, Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, 
variance, emulations, wrath, sedition, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like, of the which I tell you before and have told you in time past that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance, against such there is no law. And they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Let us not be desirous of vain glory, provoking one another, envying one another. And our, our text verse this morning be verse 25. If we live in the Spirit, and I want to focus on that last part of it, let us also walk in the Spirit. Let's go to the Lord in prayer this morning. Father, I love you. I thank you this morning for the Word of God. And I pray the Lord, you'll use this message in, in, a, in a mighty way, Lord. I pray, Father, as you have in the past, you'll continue to do so. Lord, I'm weak. I, I don't have the strength I normally have, but I pray, Father, for your power. I pray for Holy Ghost unction. I pray, Father, you'd speak through me. You know exactly where the message needs to reside. And, Father, you know who needs to hear it. You know exactly all about it. And, Lord, give me power to deliver it. Lord, I pray for the people that are here. I pray for the people that are listening in. And I pray, Lord, uh, there are people everywhere that have needs. I pray you'd meet them this morning. Please, Lord, do a work that we cannot do. And, Father, I just put myself in your hands. I turn it over to you, and I ask you, Lord, to, to work on your people this morning. And we ask you for Christ's honor and glory. In his name we pray. Amen. 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 Well, it's good to be with you in church this morning. And we've been going through Galatians. And uh, Galatians, again, it's, it's a book all about... Law versus grace. It's all about the flesh versus the spirit. It's all about uh, it's all about uh, trying to do it yourself or letting Christ do it. And we've we've argued this with Paul. We've gone down through this. He's made every kind of, of argument, and he's brought this down to simply the flesh and the spirit. And that's where we are this morning. And I'm not going to try to go all back through the past. If you want to go back and review it, I suggest you go back and review it. But I will read a few verses leading up to where we're at this morning. Uh, I do want to. I do want to back up just a little bit. Let me see where I want to back up to there. I want to back up there to verse 16 and read verse 16 through 18. He said, "This I say then: Walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the lust, for the flesh lusteth against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary the one to the other, so that ye cannot do the things that ye would." But if you be led by, of the Spirit, you're not under the law. So we need to remember that, that there's a battle going on inside of our, if we're saved, if we are, if we are Christian, if we have been washed in the blood of Jesus, we have a spirit that has been brought to life by the Spirit of the living God, and it was not there before we got saved, but it became, it became alive in us, and that's the part of us that communicates with God, and God communicates with us. We don't communicate with God through our flesh. We don't communicate with God through our soul. We communicate with God through our spirit. Okay? And the Bible tells us to walk in the spirit. Now, that, that's, we'll get into that in just a minute. I'm not going to jump into that yet. But I, I, want, I want you to understand that we're being given a command here. Okay? We're being given a command because our tendency when we get up every day is to just do things in the natural way. Our tendency is just to get up and, and, and to not think about God, our tendency is to get up and just go about the motions of our day and forget that we need to deal. We need to talk to God, that we need his help, we need his power. We need the Holy Spirit of God to function and operate and act in us and conduct in us in, 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 the, in, the, in the, uh, the love and the compassion of Christ so that we deal with people in a Christ-like manner and not in a rude, fleshly manner. But this is general. This is talking about our whole life, not just a day-to-day -day thing. Now, he goes and he talks about the works of the flesh versus the works of the Spirit. I'm going to cover that, and then I'm going to get into the message, all right? So he goes down through the works of the flesh, and I know I read them quickly, but I'm going to go back through them again. He said the works of the flesh are manifest. So we all know what they are. Everybody sees them. It's obvious. People act this way around us all the time. But he said, but they're these, adultery and fornication. Of course, adultery is sex with anybody that's not your wife, and fornication is when 
when people are not married have sex together, that's again, whether it's one or the other, they're both wrong before God. God, God. God hates both of them. And then he says uncleanness. Uncleanness is just immorality. It's lewdness. It's a lewd behavior. I, I've been around people like that. I can't stand to be around people like that. I used to be one of those people. I used to be lewd in my, in my youth. I hated. I hate what I used to be. I look back at the way I acted. I thought it was funny to be, to be dirty and to make people uncomfortable at times. I used to, when I was a kid, I, I, I at times felt that way. I'm ashamed of the way I was. That was definitely a work of the flesh. Thank God for maturity. Thank God for growing beyond that point. But again, again, that's part of the flesh. And then you have lasciviousness. That's just somebody going around lustfully, thinking lustfully, acting lustfully. Uh, uh, idolatry, worshiping something besides God, witchcraft, uh, giving power to things that don't have power and believing that they have power. Uh, that's horoscopes and astrology and, and, and all kinds of, all manner of, of evil. Uh, and by the way, it's all in modern music. Let's just go ahead and say that again real quick. Let's see anybody. I covered it Wednesday night. I talked about Taylor Swift Wednesday night. But she's a witch, whether y'all know it or not. I know most of y'all don't know who Taylor Swift is, and that's fine. But that girl's a witch, and she's leading, she's leading the youth of America down that road. Uh, <clears throat> it says hatred, variance, which is just discord amongst people. Emulations, which is somebody fighting for superiority over somebody else, trying to do somebody else in. Uh, you've got you've got a uh, wrath, which is just anger simmering under the surface, and strife, fighting, seditions, riots, heresies, envyings, murders, and drunkenness, and revelings, and such like, of which I tell you before, and I also told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. That sounds serious, don't it? Now, if you take that right there and that's all you have, that will scare the living daylights out of you for a long time. Now, here's the thing. It says, they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. The people who, listen, people who live in that state, people who live in that state constantly, they, they either are lost or they're not listening to the Spirit of God. Okay? Can a Christian fall into any one of those sins? You better believe it. All you got to do is look back through the Bible and you see Christians involved in every bit of this. If you commit one of these sins, does that mean you're not a Christian anymore? No. But it means you're certainly not right with God. If you commit, if you commit one of these sins, hey, listen, that you're not right with God and you're not walking with God and you need to get right with God. You need to get that sin cleansed out of your life and you need to surrender your life back to Him. But it doesn't mean you've lost your salvation. I know it says they that do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. This is talking about somebody who does these things and don't care a thing about it. There are people who live like that. They don't care one thing about it. You know why they don't care anything about it? Because the Spirit of God does not live in them. Okay? But then he goes on and he says, But the fruit of the Spirit, if the Spirit of God lives in you, here's what the Spirit of God will produce in you. Love. Joy. Peace. Man, I like those, don't y'all? I like having love in my life. I like having peace and feeling good about things and knowing everything's okay and, and having and having and having peace, a joy in my I mean just being able to just rejoice. I love that, amen. And and knowing I'm loved, long suffering, being able to put up with somebody uh, way beyond what most people would put up with them. Uh, gentleness, being able to deal with somebody without losing your temper, goodness, just being good, faith. Meekness. Meekness means you could you could come down with somebody, but you choose not to. You have grace with them. Uh, temperance. Being able to control yourself. All these things. The Bible says against such there's no law. These are the things that are manifested in a life where God is in control, where God is on the throne. And He said, if we live in the Spirit, in other words, if we are saved, if we live in the Spirit, I, my life is in God. My life is hid with Christ in God. I live in the Spirit. Amen. He lives in me. If I live in the Spirit, the Bible said, let us also walk in it. If I live in it, I ought to walk in it. If a man 
man ain't never had a job in his life. He's sorry and he ain't never done nothing. And somebody talks him into getting an education and he gets an education. And then he goes out and he gets him a job and he's making some money. You know he ought to carry himself a little different than he did back when he was a bum. Amen? He's got a job. People respect him now. People look up to him now. He ought to carry himself different than he did but when he was a bum and he was leaning on everybody else for everything. And when a person gets saved and they're cleansed and they're made new, they ought to carry themselves in a different manner than they did when they were lost. If the Spirit of God be in you, He's going to show up. Now, let's get into the message. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. He said, let us not be desirous of vain glory, provoking one another, envying one another. So, let me just start out by saying if you're a man and your wife tells you, don't go into the kitchen. What's your first reaction going to be? No, what's your first, what's your first word going to be? Why? And she says, I just mopped the floor. Okay. Well, she gave you a reason. You know what that does? It informs you and it also motivates you. Look, I know she mopped. And I don't want to make her mad. Right? So it informs me and it motivates me. Don't go in the kitchen. Why? Because I don't want to make her mad. So uh, if we live in the Spirit, let's also walk in the Spirit. It informs us and it motivates us at the same time. Okay? So God tells us to walk in the Spirit. And we're going to look at this carefully and we're, it's going to reveal three things, <coughs> three reasons that we ought to walk in the Spirit. And these three reasons ought to inform us and they ought to motivate us, all right? The first reason we ought to walk in the Spirit we find in verse 25. True Christians live in the Spirit. Notice there in verse 25, if, that word if, if we live in the Spirit. So it begins with the condition if. Now, if you ain't saved, you're not going to do none of this. None of this is going to make a bit of sense to you. But when the sinner trusts Christ as his Savior, the Bible tells us he is born of the Spirit. He's new. He's changed. He's been regenerated. He's been renewed by the Spirit of God. He's been indwelt by the Holy Spirit of God. Titus 3, 5 says, Not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us, by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost. So we've been saved, washed, and renewed. So, if, and only if, this has happened in your life, or is it possible for you to walk in the Spirit? You can't do it otherwise. Unless you've been washed, clean, regenerated, and renewed by the Holy Spirit of God. There's no way you can you had to have believed on what Christ did for you on the cross, that he died for you, was buried, rose from the grave, and got born again, or you can't have the Holy Spirit, and you can't enjoy this. Thirdly, when an unsaved person attempts to walk in the Spirit, they're going to fail. You say, why would an unsaved person attempt to walk in the Spirit? Because they've had a religious experience but didn't get saved. They came to church, they went down front, they felt bad about their sin, but they didn't trust Christ. A lot of people do that. They weep when they hear about how bad of a sinner they are. They, oh, they get all upset and blubber and carry on, but they don't put their faith in Christ. They still somehow think they can change it or they can turn over a new leaf. They can do better. And when they try their best, the preacher says you've got to walk in the Spirit. You've got to let the Spirit of God live in you. And they try, they can't do it because they're not saved. The Holy Spirit is the only one that can enable you to walk in the Spirit. You better make sure Christ has saved your soul. It's the most important thing you ever need to check on, to make sure that he lives in you. <clears throat> Living in the Spirit is the subject of this verse. Living in it. In the context, Spirit is capitalized here in this verse. Notice that. And it's obviously the Holy Spirit that we're talking about, not a person's inner spirit, because our, our spirit's a little s. Holy Spirit's capital S. All right? Christians are to live in the Spirit. So, again, like I said, the Holy Spirit, he's the, one, he's the one who regenerated and took us from what we were and made us something that's acceptable before God. 
Amen? He's, he's the third part of the Trinity. He's the third part of the Godhead. And he has a very powerful work in regeneration. He has a very, very powerful work in making us new. He's the one that did that regeneration. He's the one that gave us that new life. Yes, Christ paid for it. Christ made it possible. He presented the gift, but the Holy Spirit's the one that did the work of making us right with God. Galatians 3, 2 through 3, it says, This only would I learn of you. Received you the Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Are you so foolish, having begun in the Spirit, are you now made perfect by the flesh? So Paul's asking them there, he's saying, did the Spirit of God do this or did y'all do this? Did you get yourself straightened out or was it the Spirit of God? I think it was the Spirit of God. He's the one that did all that. Jesus said in John 3, 6, that which is born of the flesh is flesh. But that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. You and I, we're slaves. We're different from the rest of this world that don't know Jesus. Now, you can't tell it standing one up next to another. But God can tell it. Because, listen, God doesn't communicate with that one that's lost because they can't hear him. They can't hear him. Oh, they see what he's done all around them. They can look at his word. But unless the Holy Spirit of God breaks into their subconscious, they're not going to hear God. Thirdly on this, Christians live in the Spirit or in the presence of the Holy Spirit because he lives in the heart of every believer. Romans 8 and 9, it says, But ye are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. Now if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he's not of his. So, Again, it's so important that, that we recognize the Spirit of God living in us. He, it's, it's the fact that we have Him in us. You know, it's, it's funny. We use, we use funny language sometimes. We teach little kids. We say, you, have Je you ask Jesus in your heart? The truth of it is, Jesus is seated at the right hand of the Father. Okay? In heaven. Jesus is seated there. The Holy Spirit is the one who lives in us. The Holy Spirit is the one who lives in us. Amen. It's the Spirit of God in us. He's the one, we, he's the one we, we talk to. He's the one who leads us. He's the one that guides us. He's the one that convicts us. And if we live in the Spirit, the Bible says we ought to walk in it. Okay? What does that mean? That means we ought to put that into practice in our life. We ought to let the Spirit of God guide us. We ought to let the Spirit of God direct us. We ought to let the Spirit of God empower us. We ought to let the Spirit of God encourage us. <clears throat> the second reason that we ought to walk in the Spirit is because yielded Christians are able to walk in the Spirit. Now notice I, I said yielded Christians are able to to walk in the Spirit. Not just any Christian. There's lots of Christians who struggle. I, I, I know plenty of Christians who struggle hard every day just to walk with God. And the reason they struggle to walk with God is because they don't live in the Spirit. They live in the flesh. But it's possible. It's possible to have a victorious life. Maybe you, maybe you don't think it is because you've never been victorious over some things in your life. But it is possible to live a victorious Christian life. It's within your ability. Walking in the Spirit. We're to be walking in the Spirit and walking in and by the power of the Holy Spirit. We're to be continually walking in close fellowship with the Holy Spirit. And by walking with him in close, and what I mean by that is, is when you get up in the morning and you read your Bible, when you spend time with God, you're communing with the Holy Spirit. And if you don't do that, it's hard to follow directions of somebody you don't ever talk to. We're supposed to listen to him. We're supposed to be walking with him and being in communication with him and, 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 and letting him, and, and you know, when we come to a difficulty in our day, what do we do? Do we, oh, I don't know what to do now. No, we say, Lord, I need help. Guide me. Show me what to do. Give me a leading as to what to do. I don't want to make the wrong decision. 
It may be that you that the Holy Spirit brings a Bible verse to your mind that answers the question. It may be that the Holy Spirit bumps you into somebody who has the answer to the question. It may be that the Holy Spirit puts on your mind to call somebody who has the answer. But God is going to work in your life. God ain't going to leave you hanging. God doesn't do that. If you need Him, He's there. He does, He's not busy where He can't talk to you. You know, and, and the opposite of that is, is people that just say, well, I'm just going to let the Spirit, Holy Spirit just take over the steering wheel of my life. And I'm going to make a confession here. I'm going to make a confession. I've been a little harsh. I, I criticize pretty hard the whole bumper sticker thing, the whole God is my co-pilot. Y'all have heard me do that two or three times. But after putting this message together, maybe I'm a little harsh on that. I realize that. Because, again... And this whole, I'll just let the Holy Spirit take control of the wheel of my life. I, I know that kind of goes along with that song that country girl sang, that Jesus take the wheel and all that, but that's the attitude of some people. But the problem with that, the problem with that whole thing of Jesus take the wheel is that it takes away your responsibility out of it. You have a responsibility to righteousness. Because look here, if, if God was behind the wheel of your life all the time, then, then you'd automatically just have to go wherever he went. You'd have, to go, you'd have to be forced to go everywhere he went. You know, the Holy Spirit would say, no, you stay behind the wheel. You need to stay behind the wheel. And I'm going to stay right over here in the passenger seat. You just go everywhere I say. You just stop when I say stop, and you go when I say go. You hold your tongue when I tell you to hush. You look away when I tell you to look away. You get away from that when I tell you not to listen to that. Turn your phone off. Turn your TV off when I tell you to, when I prompt you to. Witness to that person when I prompt you to do so. That's what the Holy Spirit wants you to do. When you yield to His commands... You're yielding to the leadership of the Holy Spirit. And that's what we are to do. That's how we walk in the Spirit. We yield to Him. So basically what you are at this point, you're the chauffeur for the Holy Spirit of God. And, you, and He's directing you. He's telling you where He wants to go and what He wants to do. And you're to go and do what He wants you to do. Can I tell you something encouraging this morning? God will never ask you to do something that's beyond your ability. He won't. Because if you are a true Christian, you can walk in the Spirit. It's possible. But listen closely to me. Walking in the Spirit requires submission. You must submit yourself to God. If we turn to Galatians chapter 5, 16, which is where we were at just a minute ago. Oh, well, I turn there, just look there. And he said, This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. So that's a promise, right? That's what it said. It said if you do this, you won't do that. It's a promise. But it requires that we yield our will and submit our will to the Holy Spirit of God in order for this to happen. To walk in the Spirit, we have to submit. If somebody said, Hey, come on, take a walk with me. You have to submit yourself to walk with me. Because you were doing something. And they said, come on, walk with me. Well, you're submitting to their leadership and you're walking. And that's all God's saying to you. God's not trying to be uh, some harsh taskmaster on you. He's saying, come with me. I've got some things to do and some places to go. And I want to show you and I want you to walk with me. Just like a father and a son, I want to show you how to do this stuff. Come on, boy. Let's go. That's the way God wants you to be with him. He wants you to go with him. He wants you to, he wants you to learn what he knows. He wants you to know the people He knows. Amen. He wants to introduce you to some people He knows. He wants you to get to know His crowd instead of your crowd. And what we have to do is we have to surrender to the conviction of the Holy Spirit of God. Because if you're a Christian, the Holy Spirit is trying to get you to walk right. If you're a Christian, if the Holy Spirit of God lives in you, He's trying to urge you to listen. He's trying to urge you to...
to obey, to submit, because that's the only way we sing it, don't we? Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. We know this stuff. But we have to submit. We've got to quit being so cantankerous with God and trying to do it our way. Colossians 2, 6, As ye have therefore received Christ Jesus, the Lord, so walk ye in him. It's not hard. It's not rocket science. It's just, just if he loved you, love him back. He, hey, he came all the way to this earth and died for you. Live for him. I got some news for you this morning. The Holy Spirit of God is never going to zap you and make you a super Christian. It ain't going to just happen. You're going to wake up one day, I'm off. I feel so close to God today. I'm going to turn the world around for God. I, I mean, it don't happen. It don't happen like that. You don't wake up one day and just, it just it's all over you. No, it's not like that. You're not going to walk down the aisle, down the altar either, and just like electrical shock, and all of a sudden you're some super Christian. No, it don't work like that. You have to participate and over a period of time, you grow stronger. It's just like growing up as a child. You don't, you don't become a man overnight. You have to be a boy. You have to grow and change. And as a Christian, you start off as a baby in Christ. And you grow up to be what you ought to be, growing up in Christ. But it takes time. It's a process. You know, I know sometimes people go to the altar and they say, Lord God, please make me a strong, victorious Christian. I'm tired of failing so much. But what we fail to realize is God has already given you the ability to be a victorious Christian. And He gave you that ability when the Holy Spirit of God came to live inside of your being. The, the, the power is there. You just failed to hit the power switch. But the power is there. He's there waiting to activate your life and turn you into something that magnifies and glorifies your Savior. We just got to submit to His will. Because God is not going to force you to against your will. Anybody here go to driving school? Did y'all have driving school in high school? Anybody? All right. Well, some of you know what I'm talking about. I had Red Weaver at North Lamar. He was an alcoholic. He was a lot of fun. He was an auto mechanics teacher. He used to pour whiskey in his coffee cup out there in the mornings. He was a he was a hoot. But uh, anyway, he, he he and he take us on some adventures in that student car. But anyway, he was he he'd take us out and and uh one thing about that that drive that instructor's car, you know, he got his own brake over there on the passenger side. And if he decides to yank that sucker, you're gonna stop. And you know, when he tells you he's sitting over there, he's got you on the wheel, you got all your controls, but when he tells you to turn, you need to turn. If he tells you to slow down, you need to slow down. If he tells you to stop, you need to stop. And if you don't slow down fast enough, you know what he's going to do? He's going to pull his brake cord, and you're going to stop. And then when he pulls that brake cord, guess what else he's going to do? He's going to turn over and give you a stern talking to about listening to what I say instead of what you think you ought to do. You follow my instructions. And that's exactly what the Holy Spirit of God will do. He's got the brake, too. He can yank, he can yank your brake in a hurry if he wants to. And he'll give you a stern talking to in your heart that you've done the wrong thing. He's gonna, uh, but I'm going to tell you something. He may, he may yank on the brake, but he will not make you stop. You have to do the stop. You've got to listen to it. And sometimes we may have to learn the hard way. He may have to let us go on crash. He may have to let us go on crash a few times before we realize that we've got to listen to it. But seriously, here's the thing you've got to realize. Our sin hurts us. And he knows that. And he don't want us to hurt ourselves. He doesn't want us to hurt ourselves and he don't want us to grieve him because our sin grieves him. The Bible tells us right there in Ephesians 4.30, And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God whereby you're sealed unto the day of redemption. Just imagine that with me for a minute. God is living inside of you and He's got all the hope in the world for what you could be because all the potential is right there and you don't do anything with it or you go the wrong direction. And He's grieved because He, he wants you to listen. He wants you to follow. He wants you to love Him back. And we get so selfish and so hard-hearted and so hard-headed. 
and we miss out on all the blessings that God would give us when we do. We make our life twice as hard as it ought to be. I want you to realize something else. Living the Spirit-filled life is not you becoming strong. It's not you becoming strong. It's you recognizing how weak you are. I know that sounds like an oxymoron. I guess it kind of is. But when you, when you realize you, that, that, that you need God to guide you, you need God to lead you, you need God to direct you, and you understand it's the Holy Spirit living inside you. He's put there to do all those things. And you, you, you relinquish control to Him and you say, I'm not going to make all my own decisions and do all my own things the way I want to do things in my life and say, it's my life and I'll live it how I want to. I'm going to realize and recognize that He bought this thing with His blood and He wants to control it because it's His. And he loves me and he's a whole lot smarter than me and he knows the best for me and I need to just quit fighting and I need to give it to him. Control. Here, Lord, here's the reins. Take the wheel. Take the reins. Do this. You show me how to live. Oh, if we do that. We have to be weak to do that. You see that? You can't be strong and let God have that control. If you think you're strong, you won't ever give him control. But when you realize how weak you are, and you realize how, how, how many times you failed. And you're willing to say, you know, Lord, maybe you try and show me. Maybe, maybe, this time, maybe this time I won't jump up and say, I know what I'm doing. Maybe this time I'll say, Lord, show me. And then God will begin to lead you and God will begin to teach you. But, it, but you have to remain in that place of submission because the moment you think you know what you're doing, God is going to back away. God, again, God's never going to grab you by the hair of your head and force you to do anything. I want you to understand that. God is a gentleman. God waits on you to do the right thing. I want us to look again here at Galatians 5, 16 through 17. This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusteth against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. But these are contrary the one to the other, so that you cannot do the things that you would. We talked about that a little bit last week, about how that battle was raging inside of us. The Spirit of God fighting against our flesh. And any time we fulfill the lust of the flesh and say, you know, it don't matter, I'm going to do what I want to we're not walking in the Holy Ghost. We're not walking by the power of the Holy Spirit at that point. You know, and again, when he tells us not to fulfill the lust of the flesh, we wonder what that is. All we had to do was look back up there in the Scripture because he gave us all of those things that are included in the lust of the flesh. He answers the question for us. We don't have to wonder about it. And those are sinful deeds that are common to unbelievers. And, and Christians are not to do those things. Christians are not to live in those things. We can, we can avoid those things if we'll walk in the Spirit. And the third reason, the last one, why we ought to walk in the Spirit. It's pretty simple. God wants everybody to walk in the Spirit. He wants every Christian to walk in the Spirit. Again, looking at our text, verse 25. If we live in the Spirit, here's the phrase, let us also walk in the Spirit. That, that phrase, I'm going to give you a little English lesson, but that phrase, let us also walk, is, is what's called a subjunctive verb. The subjunctive mood of a verb, it expresses an action that's possible if the conditions are met. Okay? So if, okay, so what are the conditions? We've got to live in the Spirit. The condition is, it says, if we live in the Spirit, let us also walk. So if the conditions of us living in the Spirit are met, then we'll be able to walk in the Spirit. So what does that mean, to live in the Spirit? It means be a genuine Christian. Be real. Be honest with yourself and God. 
And, and, and confess your sins and repent when you, when you fall down. And get up and keep living for God. And, and have a desire to please Him and seek to please Him. And love other people for His sake. And share the message of Christ with other people. That's what we're talking about. Be a genuine Christian. A Christian is not somebody who knows how to get to heaven but don't care if anybody else goes to hell. A Christian is somebody who can't stand the thought of people marching into hell and can't stand it so much that they do something about it. We've got to be careful as we live in the Spirit that we don't grieve the Holy Spirit by saying corrupt things. Ephesians 4, 29 through 30 says, Let no corrupt communication proceed out of thy mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying that it may minister grace unto the hearers. What is he saying? He's saying let's don't talk a bunch of uh, garbage and unnecessary nonsense that don't do any good for anybody, but let's speak words that will help somebody to grow in the Lord. That it may minister grace to the hearers. Hey, listen, I need grace. I need somebody to tell me something that, that, will, that will show me that God's being gracious to me. That, show, that God wants to be gracious to me. Amen? I like to hear verses about that. Don't you? And it talks about how God's good and how He's merciful and how He's full of grace. That's what the Bible's telling us to do. Speak words of grace and minister grace to the hearers. And He says, and grieve not the Holy Spirit of God. So again, it's, it's possible to grieve Him. He says, whereby you're sealed under the day of redemption. You know that's one of the most important things to us, isn't it? That we don't go to hell. That we don't, isn't that important to you that you don't go to hell? It's important to me that I don't go to hell. It's probably more important than anything else I know, that I don't go to hell, that I'm going to heaven. That's the very most important thing in my whole life. Because that ain't going to just matter in this life, it's going to matter in the life to come. It's going to matter forever. So that's the very most important thing ever, is that I am going to heaven. And why in the world would I want to offend the one who assures me that I'm going to heaven? Why would I want to grieve him and make him sad? I would think that would be the last person... Because I'm kept by him under the day of redemption. It would be the last person that I would want to be offending. He said, well, he's just a spirit. No, he's a person. He's, uh, only a person can be grieved. Grieved means you felt something. You've got to be a person to be able to feel something. The Spirit of God's a person. We must not grieve him, but we must also allow him to control us. Ephesians 5, 18 and 19. And be not drunk with wine, wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. That's a comparison. Now, I've told you this before, but when a man drinks alcohol, he changes. He gets bold. He, get, he gets very affectionate sometimes. He can get very generous and just throw his money around. It, it changes a man when he drinks. And, and it also changes a man when he's filled with the Spirit. He also becomes generous with his money. He gives to missions and gives to, uh, gives to the work of the Lord and gives to the church. And, 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 and he also is, is, a, is a more genuine person and a more pleasant person to be around. And he, he has a love that he didn't have before. So, so God's using these, that comparison, a contrast, but he's, all, but he's using it to show us that we're not to be filled with alcohol, but we are to be filled with the Spirit of God. So he's telling us, He's given us a command, and he tells us also to speak to ourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. So that's an encourage, encouraging ourselves as we're filled with the Spirit. It's a passive command because you can't do anything physically to be filled with the Spirit, but what you do is surrender. You put yourself at God's feet. Lord, I just want you to take control of my life. Lord, please take control of my life. That's surrender. I give up. I'm tired of trying to do it myself. I'm tired of hitting this brick wall over and over every day and expecting something to change. I'm tired of making a fool of myself. Lord, please take control. Take over. I'm crashing over and over and over and over and over. This is insanity. I need something different. God, please. I've tried it my way. It don't work. Everybody in here knows what I'm talking about. I'm not speaking some foreign language to you. I'm telling you something that you can relate to, and you know good and well, because we've all made mistake after mistake after mistake after mistake after mistake, and we and we just scratch our heads and say, why can't I? Why can't I live better than I'm living? It's because God's not the one doing the living. It's you. And if you let God do the living, you'll find out where the victory's at. 
It's been hid all along, right there in God. You could have had it all along. All you can do is surrender, yield, submit, and allow the Spirit to fill you. He will do so. We're almost done. There's a parallel passage to Ephesians 5.19, and it's Colossians 3.16. Now I say Colossians, uh, Ephesians 5.19, let me read, uh, let me, let me read uh, that, that speaking to yourselves in songs and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your, in your heart to the Lord. So the parallel verse to that is this. It says, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom. He's talking about not just singing the songs. Now he's talking about reading the Word of God. Letting it dwell in you richly. That means you meditate on Scripture. You don't just read the Bible in the morning or, or, or read it at night and just forget what you read. No, you need to take it and... Let me, let me put it to you like this. You turn on the radio in your car and you hear a song, you shut the radio off, the hour later you're there singing that song to yourself. Why not take the Scripture and do the very same thing? Why not take that scripture you read that morning and repeat it over and over to yourself as you go about your day? Meditate on it. Think about what God's saying. Let God, let God break it down in your heart and mind and feed you off of that verse. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your heart to the Lord. So it means that we need to study the Bible and live it out in our daily lives. Not just read it, but live it. Take what we get from the Spirit and walk in it. And express it in our music. That's what God's telling us. We need to sing it. We need, you know, when you sing something, again, it sticks in your memory more, more when you sing something. We all be singing to the Lord. But does your music reflect the Lord? What you listen to, does it reflect the Lord or does it reflect this world? Does it reflect the ways of this world? Does it reflect the sin of this world? Because most music does. And your music you listen to reflects on what you, what you feel and you, and you think in your, in your heart and mind. <clears throat> God desires we walk in the Spirit. And this is to be a different walk. It's, it's to be a determined walk. Because God commands that we walk in the Spirit, we know that it, it, it's not automatic. It takes surrender. It takes submission. It takes effort on our part. This ain't going to happen just because I preached it this morning. It's going to take you making a decision. It's going to take you making a commitment to God that you're going to walk with Him. And, and I'm going to tell you, it, it's a continual daily walk. It's not something you do one time. It's something you get up every day and you, and you recommit yourself, Lord, I'm going to walk with you today. I need you today. I'm giving myself to you today afresh. Every day it's a new day and you ought to put yourself in His hands daily. And it's a harmonious walk with the Holy Spirit of God. Remember 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20, which says, What? Know you not that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, of the Holy Go a Ghost which is in you, which you have of God, and you're not your own, for you're bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God. So we're to glorify God. And how do we do that? By letting Him have control. By letting Him have preeminence in our life. And lastly, it's a walk. Y'all was waiting on that one, wasn't you? Lastly, it's a walk that yields fruit. You say, well, so what's going to happen if I, if, I, if I pray today and I ask God to take control of my life? What's going to happen today if I say, God, I don't know what I'm doing. Please guide me. Please lead me. Please walk in me. Please take over my life. What's going to happen? Well, the Bible tells you. It tells you there in verse 22 and 23. Look at it. It said, but the fruit of the Spirit is love. Joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there's no law. Wouldn't it be some if you just started loving people more than you do now? You cared about people more than you do now? You didn't look at people as obstacles in your way, just problems you got to deal with. You see people as, as, as needs that need to be met. You see, you see somebody who has a need, you say, you know what, I sure would like to do that for them. And you're not doing that because you're hoping somebody notices and you want somebody to give you a pat on the back. You just, have, you just feel compassion on them because they have a need. You say, you know what, I can take care of that. And you, and you go do something like that for them and, and you, you don't want nothing in return. That's, that's God leading you. That's God working in you and through you. Somebody, somebody mentions a, an, an issue that they're having and God immediately brings a Bible verse to your mind. And you can stand there and just hem-haw and wait for them to leave or you can say, hey, listen, let me share something with you. 
and maybe light their darkness. That's letting God lead you. That's walking with God. And you can do that if you let God be the one who leads you. I'm going to wrap this up. If you live in the Spirit, you ought to be walking in the Spirit. Plain and simple. <clears throat> Are you a genuine Christian? Are you real? Have you been walking in the Spirit all this past week? Are you submissively walking in harmony with the Holy Spirit of God? Are you allowing the Holy Spirit to direct your steps? Like I said, it ain't automatic. It takes a serious surrender and a continuing, continuous, constant work to maintain that walk. I wonder, has anybody gotten tired in here? Has anybody sat down and took a rest and forgot they were walking with God? It happens. It happens. We sit down on the curb to rest because we're tired and we forget we're supposed to get back up and keep going. I urge you this morning, if you, if you, you know in your heart, I, ca I can't look inside of you and tell anything, but God does and God can and God is. And perhaps he has been while I've been preaching this message. And perhaps he's shown you that you're not as close to him as you ought to be. Perhaps he's showing you that you're getting up and going about your life like it's yours and he doesn't own it. If God's shown you something today, I implore you, please don't ignore God. Please respond to the Spirit of God. If he's shown you, I would like to lead you and, and show you how to have victory, then listen to him and respond to him and follow him. And you will find out that if you... That, that, you can do this if you just will do this. Get up and live for God. Let's stand together. We're going to sing a song of invitation here in just a few moments. And as we do, I'm going to urge you, if the Lord's speaking to you today, either come down this altar and kneel and pray, or right where you're at, kneel and pray. If you need prayer, I'd be glad to pray with you. Whatever your need is this morning, I would urge you to do, to take care of it. We come to this hour because we want God to speak to us. Well, he's spoken. Now, what will we do with what he's told us? Let's turn to 153. We're going to pray as, here in just a moment. One, go ahead, you go ahead and turn on your book if you find it there. 153, what we're going to turn to. But let's go to the Lord and let's ask God to, to do a work in our heart today. Father, Lord, I just love you so much. I thank you, Father, for church. I thank you, Lord, for this morning's service. I ask you, Lord, that you might that you might continue and, and finish the work, Lord, that you've begun in their hearts. Lord God, I pray folks would surrender. I pray some folks would, would, would just absolutely just turn their life over to you this morning. Lord, that would be my that would be thrilling to this old heart, Lord, to see. Father, even if I don't see it, Lord, I pray it happen. Dear God, I pray that you have your way in somebody's life today. Lord, if not there is mine, Lord, take control of mine. Even greater than you have. I want you to. And Lord, we'll give you the glory and the praise, and we thank you because you know what you know what's best for us. Lord, we just love you so much. We thank you in Jesus' name. We pray. Amen. One fifty-three. I surrender all. All to Jesus I surrender. All to Him I freely give. I will.
to make sure it ain't sown. Make sure it's all. Because he bought it all. Amen. He paid for how many of your sins? All. Amen. So give it all to him. Amen.